One of the key constraints to uh, successful um, production of canola, but not only canola, but for pulse crops as well, for us, is, uh, is a disease caused by Sclerotinia sclerotiorum, or uh, Sclerotinia semrot. It's the same pathogen that, uh, that's found here. Um, and for us, infection in canola occurs primarily at flowering um, from airborne ascospores. And those ascospores infect the, uh, the blooms or the blossoms during periods of extended wetness. We really see very, very little um, infection from direct mycelial uh, contact with the roots. The symptoms, absolutely, they're very similar to what you'd see here. We see a shredding, a shattering of stem tissue um, that often can result in weakened stems and lodging. Um, the infected uh, host tissue has kind of a, this is a, the, the uh, the lesion here would have a, a characteristic grayish or whitish appearance. And if you were to split open the stem of an infected plant, you'd often find this little black resting body here. It's called a sclerotia body or a sclerote. I guess from a yield standpoint or the impact that it has on the crop, obviously it can, uh, can impact yield. Um, and it's, it's related, I guess, to the percentage of the crop, the, the number of plants that actually are carrying or, or are uh, infected by the disease, but it's not just about incidence, it, it also depends on the severity of the infection, um, whether, you have, uh, whether you have an infection on the, the main stem or, or on a lateral branch, you know. So we generally use a, a rule of thumb in, uh, in Western Canada that for every percent of your crop that is infected, so if you've got a, a hundred plants and you see that 20 of them are infected, um, the rule of thumb that we use is a half a percent yield loss for, uh, for every percent infection. Um, and the impact is, uh, is a result of kind of fewer seeds or smaller seeds. So if you've got, if you've got uh, premature ripening, uh, you won't have as good a seed set, maybe, maybe less seed set, or certainly um, the, the possibility is there for shrunken seeds and smaller seeds with lower test weight. Um, with premature ripening, you can also uh, end up with shattering uh, during the windrowing process, so shattered uh, pods and, and loss of seeds that way. And uh, those smaller seeds that, uh, that, that, that may still be captured and laid down in the windrow could, uh, could certainly um, be blown out the back <laughs> of the header during the harvesting process. Once you see sclerotinia, it's too late to make a management decision. It has to be done in a preventative manner. But one of the tools that's still pretty popular uh, that, uh, that is in use is this uh, sclerotinia checklist uh, or a disease risk assessment card. So essentially how it works is that a grower will answer questions about his canola crop, um, take into effect the environment, a little bit about the pathogen, and it will, uh, it will give a score just like Rick said here. So you have to do this on a field-by-field -field basis for every paddock. You would, uh, you would go out at early flowering and you would kind of make this assessment. It's, you don't it's, it's got to be done kind of close to the time where you would make the management decision. You can't do it pre-season. Um, you know, you can, you can understand some things pre-season, but it really needs to be done fairly close to the flowering period. As you get higher and higher above 40, you, the, the likelihood of having a, a, a meaningful response from, uh, from a fungicide application is, is, uh, is quite likely. This shows that for... Um, a disease to become problematic in a crop, you need to have a sufficient amount of the pathogen there. You need to have um, weather that's conducive for that particular pathogen, and you need to have a susceptible host. And the, the components of this triangle and their interaction can certainly be influenced by a producer's um, agronomic cropping practices or his agronomic choices. So one of the uh, agronomic um, practices or I guess choices that a, that a producer makes every year is, uh, is in his uh, establishment. Uh, his seeding rate is one thing uh, and crop density as it relates to seeding rate is an important factor for disease development. Denser canopies have uh, more suitable microclimates for disease development. So overly dense populations uh, can result in, uh, in thinner, weaker stems which are more prone to lodging. In addition to seeding rate, um, variety standability or the choice of variety and whether or not it has good, uh, good standability can certainly um, have an influence on disease development. Crop rotation. Crop rotation is another um, agronomic choice that a grower makes um, and it's a, it's a fairly successful tool 
uh, or a cultural practice that's used to, uh, to deal with many diseases, but it's not really a good cultural tool to, uh, to manage sclerotinia. There's really no relationship between the incidence of sclerotinia and the years between susceptible crops. So this is kind of a graph here of diseased plants right here and years um, either in blue since the previous canola crop or since the previous sclerotinia susceptible crop. And I don't see a relationship here. It doesn't matter whether it's one year or five years. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is that this particular pathogen is spread by windborne spores and it has that ability. So even though you may not have grown canola last year, uh, sorry, here, your neighbor did, and it's spores that will have blown from his paddocks into yours that can cause an infection. Now they don't blow that terribly far. Uh, it's not like a rust spore that, uh, that can blow for, for hundreds of kilometers. It's really only two, three, maybe 500 meters max, um, and, and certainly it declines with, uh, with distance. So we do say, certainly try and avoid planting canola to adjacent fields. Where, uh, which have been heavily infested by sclerotinia the previous year, because that will help to reduce. So similar to blackleg. So once you've got sclerotinia in your soil, um, the, uh, the, the chance of it popping up again the next time the weather is, is right is pretty good. Fertility, uh, again, directly influences crop density. So if you've got an uh, aggressive fertility program and you're really trying to to go for uh, high yield in, in high moisture uh, zones, um, that, will, uh, that will increase your risk of disease development. Um, and it often results in higher levels of disease just due to lush canopy development. This just sort of shows the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the impact of the agronomic choices um, and how, how it influences the risk of sclerotinia. But the critical infection period, and this doesn't, I, from what I understand, it really doesn't change between our countries, is during that early flowering stage. Um, and so a key Canadian industry message, whether it be from Bayer, from the government, from other competitive companies, is to spray early. And uh, our ideal time is that 20 to 30% bloom stage. And there's a few reasons that, that this is the, the best stage. You want to try and protect as many petals as possible before you see significant petal drop. So, Main stem petals are the ones that generally lead to um, infections that girdle the main stem. And, and the main stem is, is uh, the, the pods that develop on the main stem are the ones that generally contribute the most to, uh, to yield. Certainly the laterals do, uh, do a lot as well. But spraying early helps to protect those main stem petals and stop the, uh, the, 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 the more prevalence of main stem infections. And then the other thing is that Earlier infections have more time to develop and subsequently then have more time to cause damage to the plant. We certainly say that good spray canopy coverage, um, if you can get good coverage down into the canopy, which is easier to do at an earlier flowering period, um, and if you can get spray down into, uh, into some of those lower leaves um, and then you have fungicide actually in the plant and, and maybe even on the stems, when those infested or infected petals are dropping, you've already got protection there. So that's, that's pretty important as well. So to sum up sclerotinia, um, it certainly is a disease that, that has the potential to cause substantial losses every year for us in Western Canada. It is extremely variable though in its occurrence and severity from year to year, from region to region and field to field. Um, yield loss, again, can be variable um, depending on the growth stage that the infection occurs at um, and uh, it is really related to the, uh, to the weather conditions that, uh, that were present. Um, I talked about the, the success of cultural controls. Our uh, measures are, are fairly limited. Um, you know, we talked about the sclerotia and how long they can last in the soil. The fact that uh, the ascospores can, can blow in from neighboring fields. And uh, one thing that we didn't really talk about was that um, this particular disease has a massive host uh, range. There are pretty much any broadleaf crop can, uh, can act as a host for sclerotinia. For us, fo foliar fungicides remain the, the main control strategy and we're working on, on some tools that provide guidance to growers uh, for fungicide application and, and uh, we're, we're continuing to refine these tools. And lastly, there are um, tolerant varieties available. Um, and efforts continue to improve the, the varietal resistance in both the public and the private sector.
timing is very critical for when we're putting on uh, Prezaro chasing Sclerotinia and it, the sweet spot's this 20 to 30% from what we've sort of seen. From that 2011 year, just surmising a few yields, we had sort of a, a this is compared to doing nothing, we had about a 15% response on average over the sites. Rovril, which was registered at that point, was our only sort of option, but um, just not quite as effective and it's really a, a good protectant, but it doesn't hold disease if it's sort of um, already there. So if you've got leaf lesions, it doesn't stop that infection getting worse, whereas Prezaro seemed to hold it. Uh, this was actually in a reasonable year, I guess you'd call it, out of New South Wales last year. There was a bunch of commercial sites that were done. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, I haven't got the risk factors, but we had some really big yield responses to some sites, but you know, a lot in this sort of, you know, around that sort of 10% up to 20. And, and that's probably a more realistic, uh, unless you're in that really high uh, pressure zone, um, what sort of yield responses we might get to sclerotinia. Yield maps as well, we've got here not, no treatment. You can see a lot more orange, a lot more green where we've got um, our Prezaro here and we had a 1.85 going up to 2.17. Um, there's untreated again and there's Prezaro. So in this site it was about a 15% response. And uh, this one's not quite as exciting a town name but it's an even more impressive response. So a lot of red in the untreated um, and Prezaro doing a very good job and a you know, very high pressure in Thumper. And uh, you can see that from the yields as well, you know, up in that getting towards three tonne, we've got pretty big canopies. Risk factors, and you know, for us, these are sort of ours. I mean, we know that things like albus lupins and broadleaf crops and pasture, um, you know, these sorts of things for us are risk factors. Just some summaries of, of Prezaro, and you know, again, we see these greener, healthier plants, and. You know, maybe that in part is part of the yield responses that we're seeing. We seem to hold a few more leaves for a little bit longer in the canopy. Maybe that helps a little bit with, uh, with fill. Um, the single spray, we, we know from before that this um, 20 to 30 percent flowering is, is our sweet spot as well. When we get out to 40 or 50, it's too late. There's some merit, and I'm only saying merit in inverted commas because we need to prove it in a wet year um, with two sprays for, for sclerotinia.